Hello everybody, I am John Allen and this is Last Week in the Church, the show where we harvest the fruits of the last week of journalism on the Vatican and Global Catholic Church beat. Here's what we've got for you this week. We begin with pilgrimage to the peripheries. Pope Francis is set to leave this coming Thursday on a five-day trip to Mongolia. We will explain why it's a classic case of a big thing in a small package because Mongolia, population-wise, is a very small place. Nevertheless, both geopolitically and pastorally, there are some very large irons in the fire. Second, of synods and schisms. Pope Francis's much-anticipated Synod of Bishops on Synodality is set for October. It opens up on October 4th. Recently, a couple of American bishops have weighed in warning of possible schismatic tendencies in the Senate. We'll explain why schism is likely to be the second most popular word starting with S you will hear during the month of October. Third up, bricks by bricks. In this case, we're referring not to that basic building block of construction, but rather the BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, this global alliance intended as an alternative to the U.S. and the G7, which recently added six new members this past week, and why that may actually be a key element of the end game of the diplomatic dimension of Pope Francis's papacy. Fourth, we have the Ciro Malabar standoff, why this chronic and seemingly intractable division in India's Ciro Malabar Church has defied even the efforts of a recently appointed papal delegate to resolve them. We'll explain why the resistance there may be feeling the wind at their back a little bit. And then finally this week, you can take the Italians out of church, but you cannot take the church out of Italians. We will explain why recent data pointing to some worrying trends in terms of mass attendance here in Italy doesn't really augur the death knell of Catholic culture in Il Bel Paese. All that and more is waiting for you on this week's edition of Last Week in the Church. So, for the love of God, in the name of all the angels and the saints and everything that is holy, don't go anywhere, don't change that dial, don't click away. I will be right back. So, notoriously, Intelligence and wisdom are not the same thing. It is actually possible to be incredibly smart and also incredibly foolish. Footnote, it is also possible to be a total idiot and a great fool. My life is sort of a laboratory experiment in what happens when both of those things are true. But that's not our point here today. Our point here today is that history is replete with examples of the great mischief that can result when intelligence and wisdom become decoupled. If you want a refresher course in this point, by the way, I recommend you go see the brilliant new movie Oppenheimer, which is basically a three-hour meditation on precisely this point. However, the contrary is also true. That is, if disaster is often the result when intelligence and wisdom separate, triumph and amazement is often what happens when intelligence and wisdom come together. And this is a roundabout setup for a naked commercial plug because I'm here today to recommend a new piece of technology to you. It's a new app called Magisterium AI. And basically, it is an effort to combine intelligence, in this case, artificial intelligence, with the great spiritual and ethical wisdom of Catholic teaching. It is an app that is by now trained on more than 3,000 official church documents. It is available in 10 languages, so pretty much any tongue you would, you know, wish to get an answer in. And what you can do is you can go on to this app and ask it questions, ranging from really high-end egg-headed stuff to, like, explain the doctrine of transubstantiation or what were the issues in the Arian heresy, all the way down to the kinds of banal things that real people would ask, like, what's the deal with the Pope? Or... You know, the Virgin Mary, do you guys worship her? Like, what's the thing? You know, whatever your question is, this tool will give you cogent, insightful, well-written answers. So whether you are a priest who needs talking points for a homily, or you're a CCD teacher who has that one precocious kid in class that won't stop asking you questions, and speaking as the former precocious kid in class, I know how a annoying that slice of life can be. I raised it to a fine art. 
you know, whatever, you know, whatever your needs may be. I mean, if you're just an ordinary person with questions about the Catholic Church, because, I don't know, you read a Dan Brown novel or you watched Godfather 3 or whatever it is, this tool will be extraordinarily useful to you. It is the brainchild of our friends at Longbeard. That's a digital marketing and design company. They are the IT backbone of the Crux site and also of last week in the church. These people are geniuses. And beyond that, they're also salt of the earth, great people. And so whatever they touch basically turns to gold. This is the latest example of it. I highly recommend it to you. Now, I'm not gonna promise that if you, you know, use it, and by the way, you should, it's at magisterium.com. That's magisterium.com. I'm not going to promise you a full refund if you're not satisfied because it's free. So you don't actually have to pay anything. What I will promise is that if you don't like it, you are free to send me a note telling me that. I will use another AI app to generate an automated response in which I have no rule whatsoever. I'm actually just kidding. I would pass your response along because I guarantee you the people at Longbeard want to get this right. So again, check it out. That is Magisterium AI online at magisterium.com. By the way, if this didn't convince you, and frankly, it's me, so why should it convince you? But if you want a more intelligent presentation of the argument for this, read my wife Elise's article on the Crux site. It is replete with insight and elan and verve, and it will lay out the case in very compelling fashion. Magisterium.com, check it out. All right, everybody, happy Tuesday to you. Happy final Tuesday in the month of August. We begin this week with pilgrimage to the peripheries. Pope Francis leaves on Thursday, August 31st for a five-day visit to the nation of Mongolia. He will be there until Monday, September 4th. Now, at one level, you might ask yourself, and it would not be, you know, an off-topic question, what in God's name <laughs> is the Pope doing in Mongolia? I mean, let's start with the fact, this is the third most sparsely populated territory on Earth. If you want to settle a bar bit, by the way, the number one is Greenland, number two are the Falkland Islands, or if you're on the other side in that conflict, the Malvinas. But in any event, very few people there, population of about three million in Mongolia, Humans are outnumbered by livestock by a factor of about 20 to 1. In fact, the numbers are 3 million people and roughly 30 million sheep. And if we want to talk about Catholics in Mongolia, I mean, for the love of God, basically, it's fewer than 1,500. I forget the actual official number that the Vatican gave, but I think it's something like 1,478. I mean, in other words, you don't need a soccer stadium for all the Catholics in Mongolia. Now, you couldn't quite fit them all into a phone booth, but, you know, a decent-sized restaurant, probably, you could seat most of them. I mean, this is an extraordinarily small Catholic community. So you might ask yourself, again, come on, what's the deal? What is the Pope doing there? Well, let's start with the fact that Mongolia's two big neighbors, that is, its two largest land borders, run up against China and Russia. In other words, Two of the great superpowers of our time, two of the most relevant nations for global affairs. I mean, on anybody's top five list of the countries that have the most to do with events in the world today, they would certainly be on it, right? And so this is a stage from which Pope Francis can address these two global titans. Bear in mind, for political and cultural reasons, Pope Francis is never going to visit China. And Pope Francis is never going to visit Russia. This is going to be as close as he will ever get to either of those two nations. And so therefore, absolutely everything he says on this trip, particularly anything he says that is of a sort of social, political, diplomatic nature, that is going to be described, dissected, and digested. I could keep going with words that start with D, but you get the point with an eye towards what is he trying to say to China and Russia? In other words, what is the messaging here directed at those two nations? Now, pastorally, this trip is also very much a reflection of this pope's 
passion for the peripheries. In fact, I would suggest that not only is it an expression of that passion, it is the apotheosis of that passion. And by the way, I mean, I got to get props for that, right? I mean, how many YouTube videos are you going to watch today where somebody uses, and not, not only, but actually correctly, uses the word apotheosis, right? But in any event, you know, it is very difficult to imagine a more peripheral location in terms of population and all of that, and also in terms of Catholic infrastructure. I mean, we're talking about a country where the first official Catholic footprint wasn't until 1991. Now, you can actually trace relations between the Holy See and the Mongol Empire going back centuries, but in terms of an official Catholic presence in the country, it dates only to the 1990s. And yet, you know, that's very much in keeping with the spirit of the Francis Papacy, right? He wants to say, in a sense, size doesn't matter. I don't care what your GDP is. I don't care what your population numbers are. I care about the story you have to tell, the experience that you've lived, the wisdom you've accumulated, and I want to lift that up and let the world in on your secret. And so that's the spirit of this trip. By the way, as a footnote, pastorally, there's also some other fish for the Pope to fry. Mongolia is a country, because there are so few Catholics, there are some bureaucratic headaches in terms of church personnel, missionaries, being able to get visas, being able to get in and out of the country comfortably. No doubt the Pope and his Vatican team are also hoping that this trip will, have, will provide some leverage on that front. But I think the big picture here simply is the Pope using a small peripheral location to drive home a message first about the inherent dignity of the human person and human cultures that don't depend on their size, on their hard power. And second, also, it's a platform from which he can address issues of the day, including issues of relevance to the relationship to China and Russia. My wife, Elise, by the way, will be on the papal plane for this trip. She will have full coverage on the Crux site. That is cruxnow.com. So if you do nothing else this coming week, do be following her coverage. I guarantee you it will be the most insightful and comprehensive coverage of this trip you are going to find any place. All right. Second up this week, we've got of synods and schisms. So it is the early 21st century, you may have noticed. It's 2023. And if there is any inexorable, immutable, ineradicable, I hope you like the way I'm rolling on I words now, any just, you know, physical law of the universe in our time, it is that absolutely anything that happens must be controversial. There's going to be somebody who is going to get upset over it. I mean, if you open your mail today, if you go to the store and buy a quart of milk, there will be somebody on Twitter, oh, excuse me, X, who is, you know, blasting out complaints about the way you did it. And so in keeping with this physical law of the universe, it's like the laws of thermodynamics, the Pope's upcoming synod on synodality, despite the fact that nobody can even define synodality, nevertheless, Everybody seems to be upset about it for one reason or another, or excited, or whatever, but in any event, they're agitated. In the last little while, there have been a couple of American bishops who have sort of fired shots across the bow on this synod. Bishop Joseph Strickland of the Diocese of Tyler in Texas devoted an apostolic, well, apostolic, no, pastoral letter on August 22nd to the coming synod. Basically, he ticked off seven immutable truths, what he called immutable truths about the Catholic Church, things such as Christ founded only the Catholic Church as a pathway to salvation, that marriage is exclusively between a man and a woman, and other points, then suggested that there might be some voices at this coming synod that are going to question or challenge those teachings, and warned that if they do so, that would be a schismatic result. Meanwhile, American Cardinal Raymond Burke a hero to the traditionalist wing of the Catholic Church and a, you know, somewhat frequent flyer in terms of criticisms of Pope Francis, has pinned the foreword to a new book issued by a traditionalist group known as Tradition, Family, and Property called The Senatal Process, A Pandora's Box, in which Burke also warned that this synod may stoke doctrinal confusion and error and end up with schismatic results. Now, what's interesting about all this is that 
that label schism is also being used by supporters of the synod and the pope to describe these critics. Basically, what the supporters are saying is, hey, wait a minute, you guys are defying the pope. You're, you know, breaking company with the pope. And that's schismatic. And so you're the schismatics, not us. All of this leads me to believe that during the month of October, synodality will probably be the S word we hear the most. Number two on that hit list is probably going to be schism. I would like to make a modest proposal here. Okay. I'm sure most of us are familiar with what's known as Godwin's Law, which is this rule on the internet that says the first person to make a comparison to the Nazis in an internet argument loses. Well, I would like to propose that the synodal version of that law ought to be that in any argument about the synod, the first person to call their opponents schismatics or heretics loses. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, come on. There are going to be plenty of issues to talk about at this synod, but, you know, if you're going to devote the time to even care about a synod of bishops in the Catholic Church, I would say by definition, you're not a schismatic and you're not a heretic, right? You're just somebody who has a different view about Catholic issues. So by all means, let's debate these issues. Can we please do them without the, you know, acerbic labels that just tend to polarize and make everything very difficult to deal with? I realize no one is going to listen to me. Absolutely no one. In fact, somebody is going to tweet or X. Is X the verb now? Do you X something? I don't even know what you call it. But in any event, somebody is going to go on X 30 seconds after this video is posted and say that what I just said is by definition schismatic or heretical. So I know it's going to happen, but I'm just putting it out there as a possibility on the smorgasbord of choices. All right, third up this week, bricks by bricks. So as I mentioned at the top of the show, this alternative to the G7 in global affairs, the brainchild of President Lula da Silva in Brazil, known as BRICS for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, was self-consciously sort of created as a voice for the developing world, or anyway, the non-Western world, to have its own weight, its own voice, as an alternative to the U.S., the G7, NATO, in other words, you know, the sort of Western alliance, right? And this week, the big diplomatic story of the week, the BRICS coalition added six new members. Those six new members are Argentina, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. Now, all of that certainly bolsters the standing of BRICS in global affairs. They now represent something like, I think it's 36 or 37 percent of the world's gross domestic product, and about 46 percent, that is almost half, of the world's population. So you certainly can't ignore it. How stable this coalition is remains to be seen. But here's what I want to suggest from the point of view of the Vatican. I think Pope Francis may see this expansion of BRICS as a sort of gateway to the end game, the diplomatic and geopolitical end game of his papacy. Because if you were to look at Pope Francis's to-do list, what does he really want to get done? Well, obviously, he'd like to end the war in Ukraine. Whether that is actually up to him obviously remains to be seen. But what else that might be a little bit more in the realm of the short-term achievable? Diplomatic relations with the two great holdouts, as far as the Vatican is concerned, China, and Saudi Arabia. There are only 11 nations in the world now with whom the Vatican does not have full diplomatic relations, and the two big gets on that list are China and Saudi Arabia. Both are now members of this BRICS alliance, a BRICS alliance led by the Pope's political BFF, that's Lula in Brazil, and now also bolstered by the presence of his own home country in Argentina. And so if anybody I think, has motive to look upon this fondly. It's probably Francis. And I would add, the big, tick, big picture aim of the BRICS alliance is to create a more multilateral, multipolar world in which there isn't a single superpower, i.e. the United States and its Western allies, that just utterly control everything. That is an objective to which history's first pope from Latin America and first pope from the developing world clearly and enthusiastically agrees with. And so it would seem that the stars here are aligned for this newly expanded BRICS coalition and a kind of BRICS pope, right? 
in Pope Francis to do business together. We will see how that unfolds. Fourth this week, we have the Ciro Malabar standoff. So on this show and on the correct site, we have for some time now been reporting on what I think is one of the most gripping and fascinating stories in the Catholic world these days. And that is this deep internal cleft or tension, fracture within the Ciro Malabar Church in India. That's one of the 23 Eastern churches in communion with Rome. It is the second largest after the Greek Catholic Church in Ukraine. For, well, at least two years now, really, since 2021, the Ciro Malabar Church, and in particular, its primatial diocese, the Arch Eparchy of Ernakulum Angamali, Ernakulum Angamali, which is, as I say, it's like the mothership of the Ciro Malabar Church. It is its largest jurisdiction. It's where the primatial basilica is located and so on. That Arch Eparchy has been in basically open revolt against the authorities of the church. Now, in part, this is a liturgical dispute. The governing senate of the Ciro Malabar Church a couple of years ago decided to impose a new uniform method of celebrating the Mass, which requires the priest to face the people during the liturgy of the Word, but to face the altar during the liturgy of the Eucharist. Priests and faithful in Ernakulam and Gamali argue that their local custom is to have the priest facing the congregation, the people, throughout the Mass. They have refused to implement this new system. Beyond that, there are also broader disputes over management and administration, in particular financial administration, under Cardinal George Allen Cherry, who is the head of the Ciro Malabar Church. He is currently facing seven criminal counts in Indian courts of financial mismanagement, misappropriation. We have to see how all that plays out, but that has deeply angered a number of people in the Arch Eparchy. And so all of that has sort of produced this raucous defiance of the leaders of the church. Pope Francis, in late July, named a delegate, Greek Slovakian archbishop from the, the Greek Catholic Church in Slovakia, Cyril Vazel, who was the num former number two official in the Vatican's dicastery for Eastern churches. He sent Archbishop, archbishop Vazel to try to settle this dispute. Vazel rode into town in the early part of August and announced that as of August 20th, everybody had to celebrate Mass in the new fashion, and if they didn't, priests who refused to do it would be excommunicated. So, August 20th rolls around. Care to take a guess as to how many priests, how many parishes in the Archiaparchy fell in line, complied? What would you guess? Half? Quarter? Matt, you'd be wrong. The correct answer is out of the 328 parishes in the arch eparchy, by latest count, seven. Seven of them actually followed Vazel's instructions, which means, of course, the vast majority did not. Now, you know, we don't know what's going to happen from here. Vazel has gone back to Rome to debrief Pope Francis. If you're wondering why the priests in the arch eparchy might be willing to sort of roll the dice against a threat of excommunication, I would just remind you of what happened in the Diocese of Ahira in Nigeria a few years ago when priests refused to accept a new bishop because he was not from the dominant ethnic group. Those priests were threatened with suspension by Pope Francis if they didn't accept the bishop. The vast majority of them sent in letters to the Pope saying, hey, we love you, but we got issues with this guy. In the end, nobody was suspended. The bishop's resignation was accepted. He was shipped off to another diocese and then eventually, as a kind of consolation prize, made a cardinal. My point is that if you are in the Cyril Malabar Church today, you might be thinking, well, recent history suggests that these threats, they're not always followed through on. So, you know, let's see what happens. We will obviously continue to bring you this story as it develops. Finally, this week, you can take Italians out of the church, but not the church out of Italians. So, Recent data from Istat, which is the big statistical bureau of the Italian government, has coughed up some data that has been alarming to some Catholics in Italy. What it shows basically is that now only 19% of Catholics, that's one nine, 19, go to Mass on a weekly basis. That's opposed to 31% of Catholics who say they never go to Mass. 
except for special occasions like weddings and baptisms. Everybody else is in the middle someplace. Uh, this is the exact reverse of 20 years ago when it was about 32% of Catholics said they went to Mass every week. Only about 15% said they never went. So, you know, you can understand why some people are engaging in some hand-wringing and heartburn over these numbers. But I would like to offer you a sort of glass half full reading of the situation rooted in a recent experience that my wife and I had. Let me begin with this. If you do the math, 19% of Italians is 11.28 million people. That is basically 11.3 million people who every week still show up faithfully at a Catholic church for mass. Now, do you know what the only other activity in this country is that that many people do on a weekly basis, it's watching calcio, which is the Italian word for soccer. And soccer is the civic religion here. Now, if you can stand toe to toe with calcio in terms of how many Italians are going to do it every week or going to tune in, right? I mean, that there is still some gas left in the tank, okay? You are not on death's door. But beyond that, my wife and I recently took a few days of vacation in a small town called Valle Corsa. It's located in the Alsoni Mountains. It's in the southern, southern part of Lazio, about an hour and a half south of Rome. Beautiful little mountaintop village, town of about 2,000 people. Now, what struck me walking around town was how basically every other private residence, every other store, every other public office, I mean, I'm talking about like the city council building, the police station, all of them had emblems or insignia or shrines to the Madonna, either above them or up to the side or someplace. Now, I made, a, made friends with a guy there, a guy by the name of Mario, who owns a little grocery store in the piazza that was right down the street from our hotel. His son owns the bar there. It's a whole family enterprise. Anyway, I was asking Mario about the devotion to the Madonna. And he was saying, look, this isn't like some PR campaign that was ginned up by some PR firm working for the diocese. So this is spontaneous, local, indigenous devotion. It's rooted in the fact that there is a local church there where in the 15th century, basically some plaster fell off of a wall because there was a mild earthquake or something. And what was revealed was this fresco of the Virgin Mary holding the infant Jesus. And the infant Jesus in this image appears to be sick. I mean, he has the sniffles. And so this, this image came to be known as La Madonna della Sanità, the Madonna, Our Lady of Health, right? And the people in Valacorsa believe that over the centuries, it has protected them from plague and pestilence and disease and, you know, all kinds of other maladies. It has inspired this ferocious, kind of ineradicable devotion to Our Lady in that town and in the region. Now, I asked Mario, okay, all of these people who have images of the Madonna de la Sanita above their houses or little shrines in their driveway or whatever it is, how many of them go to church on Sunday? You know, some of them will show up regularly. Some will come every once in a while. A lot of them, a lot of the guys in particular, they'll just sit in the piazza come a Sunday morning and sip coffee and talk calcio and wait until it's lunchtime and then start hitting the grappa, okay? But, he said, not a one of them. If they faced a serious life crisis, right? If their kid got sick, if they lost their job, if an earthquake, earthquake wiped out their home, whatever. He said not a one of us in a set of circumstances like that would not turn to the Madonna for protection and consolation. My point, look, you know, mass attendance is one of those variables that will rise and fall depending on a lot of factors. Certainly COVID, you know, had a lot to do with it. People got used to not showing up physically for mass and we've never really quite recovered in terms of pre-COVID levels. It has to do with, you know, broader secularization of Western culture, all kinds of things, okay? And I understand from a pastoral point of view, if you have data showing you that only one in five people in the country are going to mass, and I understand why you'd be concerned. But my other point is that that does not correlate with the extinguishing of Catholic culture in this country, because 
Just as there are no atheists in foxholes, in most respects, there are no non-Catholics in Italy. You know, you scratch beneath the surface here, and the Catholic DNA of this country is just utterly off the charts. And of course, this is the Pope's own backyard, right? And so in terms of the future stability of the Vatican, the sort of, what, the cocoon of Catholic culture that Italy historically has always provided for the headquarters of Roman, Roman Catholicism Incorporated, basically my prognostication would be that that inherent and ineradicable Catholicity, it ain't going anywhere. Take it to the bank. This is and will remain a profoundly Catholic place. By the way, if you're looking for a place to vacation in Italy, highly recommend Valla Corsa to you. Beautiful place, beautiful spa. Check it out. All right, that is our show for this week. You can find full coverage of all these stories on the Crux site. That is cruxnow.com. Once again, cruxnow.com. I'm leaving you this week with a special mandate. And that mandate is, beginning Thursday, go on the Crux site and follow my wife Elise's coverage of the Pope's trip to Mongolia. I promise you, not only will you get the latest and greatest from an informational point of view, but it will be delivered to you with verve, elan, style, and panache. Okay, these are her trademarks, so check all that out. We will be back here next week, same bat time, same bat channel. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, beat that final summer heat, and we will talk to you again very soon.